Hey there, my name is Andy Robertson with CQE Academy, and in today's video, we're going to talk about the most important concept in both statistics and in quality engineering, and that is the normal distribution. All right, let's get started and head over to the computer. Hey there, Andy Robertson here with CQE Academy, and in today, I want to talk about the normal distribution and cover some of the foundational principles of the normal distribution, including how to calculate probability. And the reason I want to cover this is because the normal distribution is probably the most important probability distribution in statistics. A lot of data out there follows the normal distribution. And as it relates to quality engineering, a lot of the complex methods and tools that we use are based on the normal distribution. Things like calculating probability, which is what we're going to do today, Creating confidence intervals requires you to understand this idea of a z-score. Performing hypothesis tests also requires you to use the z-transformation and this idea of probability to make and accept reject decision. Assessing process capability, estimating reliability, or even doing acceptance sampling are all founded on this basic idea of the normal distribution. So it's really important that you have a solid understanding of exactly how the normal distribution works. And so let's start with some of the most basic concepts. The first is that the normal distribution can be fully characterized by two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation. So let's talk about both of those now because you have to understand those before we talk about probability. So the mean value is simply just a reflection of the location or the central tendency of a data set. So let's say we're talking about an exam score, whether it's a statistics exam or the CQ exam, Let's use an example where we're talking about an exam score, like a statistics exam or the CQ exam, and the mean value of our data set is a 75. What that means is that the average value of all of the data within our data set is equal to 75. Now, one of the key elements of the normal distribution is that the median value is equal to the mean value is equal to the mode. So 75 isn't just the mean value, it's also the median value, which means it's the middle value, and it's also the mode, which means it's the most frequently occurring data point in the data set. And so, for example, let's say we've got this group of test takers, we could compare that against another group of test takers whose mean value was 90. And so you can see how the location of the distribution or the central tendency of that data set shifts to the right when our mean value is higher. Similarly, you could have a third group of test takers who, let's say their average value was a 60, and you can see how the location of this distribution changes when the mean value changes. So that's the mean. Let's talk about standard deviation. So standard deviation, which is typically reflected in this Greek letter sigma, is a reflection of the spread or the dispersion of your data set around the mean value. So let's go back to this example where we have a group of test takers, the mean value is 75, and let's say our standard deviation is equal to five. You can see how the data is distributed around the mean value. We could compare that against another group of test takers who also had a mean value of 75, right? The mean is still the same, but their standard deviation is twice as large. Let's say it's 10. So essentially the spread of this data is larger. So the distribution gets wider, but it also gets more narrow here at the peak. The other contrast here is a smaller standard deviation. So let's say again, we had a group of test takers. Again, the mean value is still 75, but our standard deviation is equal to one. So we have a much narrower and taller distribution. And I say all that to let you know that again, if you're characterizing a data set that is normally distributed, you can fully characterize that data using the mean value and the standard deviation. And now that you understand these two concepts, we can now talk about probability. So I wanna show you how to calculate probability using what's called the Z transformation. And I wanna do that using a little example. All right, so let's say we're talking about the CQE exam and we know that the data follows the normal distribution and we have a mean value of 82 and we have a standard deviation of six. And the question is, what percentage of test takers get a score less than 73? Okay, so before we get into probability, I do wanna say a few things. The probability associated with the normal distribution is equal to the area under the curve. 
So when we want to find out the probability of getting a score less than 73, we want to find out the area under this curve. And that's where we're going to use the Z transformation. The other thing I want to say before we get into this is that the normal distribution is symmetric around the mean. So half of our data points fall on the left side of the distribution. The other half of our data points fall on the right half of the distribution. And we'll use that to eventually calculate this probability. Now to do that, we use something called the Z transformation. So the Z transformation, or the Z score, is simply just a reflection of how many standard deviations you are away from the mean. So the way the equation works is we take our value of interest, x, we compare it against our mean value, and divide by our standard deviation. So in this example, our z-score associated with the value 73 is equal to 73 minus 82, which is 9, divided by 6 equals minus 1 and a half. We are essentially 1 and a half standard deviations below the mean. And you can see that here. By the way, the z-score associated with the mean value is always equal to zero. If you could imagine 82 minus 82 is zero, zero divided by any number is zero. So the z-score equals zero here, and then our value of interest is 73. It has a z-score of minus 1.5. And now that we have our z-score, we can look up the probability using a normal probability table. So this is obviously a critical element to the probability. And the way this works is we find our z-score in the table, which is right here. By the way, the z-scores run down this axis and across horizontally. So if we had a z-score of 1.59, we'd come down to 1.5, we'd move all the way across to 1.59, and we'd find our probability. But in our case, our z-score is simply just equal to minus 1.50, and what we find in the table here is 0.43319. Now visually what that looks like is, it's the area under the normal curve from zero to x. So you can see it here, area under the normal curve from zero to x. And the probability table tells us that's 43.3%. Now remember what I said earlier, that half the distribution falls on the left side of this curve, which means all we have to do is say 50%, minus 43.3 tells us that 6.7% of test takers will get a score less than 73. Does that make sense? So that's essentially probability using the z-score and the z-transformation. Remember, when we talk about confidence intervals or hypothesis tests or reliability, whatever it is, you're going to have to understand how this z-score works and how it reflects the probability of the normal distribution. So let's go into this a little bit deeper because I want to talk about other common z-scores and the probability associated with them. So if we're plus or minus one standard deviation, you can see that here, we're minus one to plus one standard deviation, that translates to a probability of 68.3%. You can see that here in the distribution in the table. The same thing is true when we're plus or minus two standard deviations. So again, you can come down here to the table, you can say 47.725% times two is 95.5%. And then it's not even on the table here, but if you went all the way down to plus or minus three standard deviations, that would capture 99.5% of the distribution. Those are some really common probability numbers associated with, you know, plus or minus one sigma or two sigma or three sigma. All right, so now I want to switch gears. And instead of talking about a z-score and translating that into a probability, what I want to do is I want to start with the probability and translate that back into the z-score. So let's switch gears and do that now. And specifically what I want to do is I want to essentially show you how some of our most common z-scores have sort of been derived using this table. So for example, let's say you want to create a 90% confidence interval. How do we know that that truly is a z-score of 1.65? So obviously I'm showing you the z-score, but how do we do that using this probability table? So essentially what you do is you scan through this table and what you're looking for is a probability level that most closely matches 45%. Now remember this z-score of 1.65, and we can look at it visually here, represents the area under the curve from the mean value to the z-score. So 45% of our distribution falls on the right half of our distribution and then all the way down here to negative 1.65 standard deviations away from the mean 
captures another 45%. So cumulatively, when we are plus or minus 1.65 standard deviations away from the mean, we capture 90% of our distribution. And then this is probably the most common z-score that we see in statistics, whether it's a 95% confidence interval or a hypothesis test with a 5% significance level. What we're looking for here, again, is a probability equal to 47.5%, and that occurs at a z-score of 1.96%. And again, we can see this pictorially. So when we are plus or minus 1.96 standard deviations above and below the mean, we capture 95% of our distribution. Similarly, if we wanted to find a 97.5% confidence interval, that's a z-score of 2.24. And again, pictorially, this looks like this. So when we're 2.24 standard deviations above and below the mean, we capture 97.5% of our distribution. And then, of course, we can look at the 99% confidence interval or maybe a hypothesis test at a 1% significance level, and we can find that z-score to be 2.58. So again, what we do is we come here to the table, we find the 49.5% probability level, and again, that translates here. So when we are 2.58 standard deviations above and below the mean, we end up capturing 99% of the distribution. Now remember, 49.5% is on the right half, and the other 49.5% is on the left half, and that's where this number comes from. So remember, this probability level represents the area under the curve from the mean value up to the standard deviation or down to the negative version of the z-score, and that's how we end up with a 99% probability. All right, that's it. Head over to CQ Academy if you have any questions, or email me at andy at cqacademy.com. All right, that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed it. More importantly though, I hoped you learned something and I hoped I helped you move forward in your journey to become a CQE. If you really liked it, hit that like button so other people just like you can find it. And if you really loved it and you wanna continue on that journey of becoming a CQE, hit that subscribe button so that you get notified of all future videos. All right, that's it. Have a good one, bye.